So good to see everybody back again this evening. We're continuing our series of lessons on a study of defining love. Since love is the greatest, and above all things, we're supposed to be putting on love. And the primary two commandments is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbors yourself. Since that is the case, we need to understand what love is. And the best definition of the subject is, of course, in the Word of God. And the primary text we've been using here is over 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Uh, and in this particular text, God defines love by the things that it does and by the things it does not do. From the lesson this evening, we're going to be here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. It talks about how love does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil. Now, what I've done here in the first part of the opening of the sermon is take this particular verse and give you three different translations of it. There's a reason for that, because I want to make sure we're understanding because we're trying to define something. And whenever I read this, love is not provoked, does that mean love never gets angry? Period. <laughs> well, if that's the case, I'm in trouble. But if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, in the King James, it says, Doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not its own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil. Notice this word, easily. That, I believe, is the key. I believe the King James is correct here by putting this particular word in there. It's not simply not provoked. It's not easily provoked. Again, from another translation, it does not, it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. Again, notice the word easily. I think that's the key word to understand. What we're talking about out here when we're talking about love does not easily become provoked. Anger is an emotion that we human beings struggle with. And being honest with myself, if I were going to examine my own personal flaws and spiritual weaknesses and label them as far as what my greatest weaknesses are, 40 years ago when I was really first starting off as a preacher, toward the top of the list was anger. 30 years ago, when I'd grown some, top of the list, close to it, was anger. Okay, 20 years ago, you know, 20 years being a preacher. Toward the top, you're kidding, anger. 40 years now, toward the top, anger. I'm telling you this because I got a gut feeling that's the way you are. But if you were to do an honest looking at yourself, seeing where your spiritual flaws are, that you would recognize you've been struggling with your anger and your temper probably for a long, long time. And so I'm wanting you to realize that this is something that we need to realize as part of actually loving individuals, showing love to people, is that we're not allowing the things they are saying and doing to set us off to where we allow our anger and the way in which we speak to them and treat them do harm to them spiritually. First of all, before we ever get into the sermon, there's something you've got to understand about our desire for everybody. Our desire for everybody is that they go to heaven. We want everybody to be saved. And as far as my interacting with people, the last thing I want for me is for my anger to cause me to sin against someone and get in the way of them being saved. I don't want my struggle with my anger and my temper to become a stumbling block to other people and keep them from coming to the Lord. That's why you have to understand this is actually part of love that we need to continually be working at. Psalm 103, verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. Notice it doesn't say never to anger, slow to anger. That's the way God is. Psalms 145 and verse 8, the Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger, and great in mercy. That's what we're talking about. Not easily angered, not easily provoked. The reality is, the things you want are going to break. <laughs> okay? Your, your, your appliances in your house, you know, your dishwasher, your dryer, your clothes washer, your refrigerator, they're all going to break. 
Your air conditioner is going to break. Your heater is going to break. You got a nice new car. Got some bad news for you. It's going to break. Your body is going to break. Things fall apart. That's our world. The next reality is sometimes people behave in ways in which they should not. Sometimes people are going to say things to you that are downright rude and mean and even sinful. Sometimes they even sin against you and the things they're doing to you. Okay, that's the world we're living in. Sometimes people sin against you in words and deeds. The big question is, how are we going to respond to these realities? How are we going to respond to the temporary nature of our possessions? How are we going to respond to the temporary nature of our own body? How are we going to respond to people in the world saying and doing things against us that are rude, hurtful, and even sinful? That's what we're talking about. Our response to those actions. We should not be easily angered. <clears throat> to where the first time something shows a sign of possibly being broken, we fly off and start screaming and hollering. Or the first time someone does anything that's hurtful, we fly off with our anger and our temper. So you see, brethren, we got work to do. Because this is what we're trying to get to. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 1. Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence of, uh, I am based, excuse me, who in presence am abased among you, but being absent and bold toward you. What I've got, look at what I've got in yellow tent here. By the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I want to talk to you for a moment about that word meekness. Meekness is not weakness. That you are so weak you can't respond. That you are so afraid you can't do anything. That you're a coward. That you're yellow. That's not meekness. Meekness is strength. Strength and control of your emotions to where you're not allowing the things that are going wrong to cause you to sin and misbehave in any way. Meekness is strength. Matthew says in chapter 27, 11 through 14. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priest and the elders. And stop right there. We're talking about the trial of Jesus here. He's already gone before the Sanhedrin in the middle of the night in a mockery of a trial. He's gone before the Sanhedrin in the morning. He's had to deal with false witnesses. He's already had to deal with people slapping him and beating him and saying, who proph prophesied to us? Who is the one that hit you? He's already had to deal with that. And now you've got, look here, the chief priest and the elders. I love the old King James here. I love the King James language. They were vehemently accusing him. <laughs> I love that word. That, that's the way I like that text because that gives you the intensity. They weren't just there controlling themselves, saying things. They were losing it and accusing him. He answered nothing. Stop right there. That's meekness. When all these people are accusing him and they've absolutely lost it and they're accusing him and accusing him and accusing him and they've already sinned against him again, again, again. He says nothing. Absolute control. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he answered him, not one word. Now look at the last part here. So the governor marveled greatly. Pilate, marveling greatly, was not thinking this man is an idiot or this man is a coward. No, 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 no. Pilate understood what he was seeing. He was seeing a man with absolute control of his emotions. Absolute control. Not allowing others completely losing it and sinning against him to cause him to lose it at all. He was seeing strength. That's what we're working toward here. We're trying to grow in the strength of controlling our emotions. And in particular, the emotion of anger and wrath. There's Peter chapter 2, 21-23. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, 
leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Continuing, he says, and when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. That's meekness. That's the ability to maintain control of yourself. When Jesus was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he was threatened, didn't make him do anything against the person. As a matter of fact, going even further, he's already been scourged. He's already been marred more than any man and been nailed to a cross. He is surrounded by people that absolutely hate him, that are reveling and rolling in his crucifixion and loving it. And what does he do? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Folks, that's love. That's love. He is not allowing the things done against him by others to cause him to ever get to the point to where he stops loving them. What was his desire for everybody around the cross? For them to be saved. Please understand, that's the ultimate goal for everybody that we want. To love your neighbors yourself, that means everybody out there, and what your desire and hope is for everybody out there, is that they might be saved. So Jesus praying on the cross, he loved all those people who were sinning against him. He never lost control. James says in chapter 1, 19 through 20, So then, my beloved brethren, that every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, look at this now, slow to wrath. That's what we're talking about, slow to wrath, not easily provoked. And then he says, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Now, some of you are visitors here, so you haven't heard me preach a whole lot. Some of you heard me preach for decades. <laughs> and so I'm going to ask a question here. They all know the answer to it. You may not know the answer. What's the best thing to say when you're angry? The answer is nothing. What's the best thing to do when you're angry? The answer is nothing. I break away from people sometimes when I'm really, really angry. If you see me in the woods, walking through the woods, don't talk to me. I don't hunt. That's just how angry I am. The wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Let that sink in. When we're caught up in this emotion, and we say and we do things, oh, it's not going to be kind and helpful and constructive. Ecclesiastes says in chapter 7 and verse 9, Do not hasten in your spirit to be angry, for anger rests in the bosom of fools. So again, you're going to be saying and doing things that are foolish, that are hurtful, that are destructive. Again, notice hastening in your spirit to be angry. Again, not easily provoked. That's why it's saying the same thing a different way. I love this text here in Proverbs 27 and 4. Wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous. But who's able to stand before envy? If you're going to say something when you're angry, or do something when you're angry, it's probably going to be cruel or outrageous. There are going to be words and deeds that you would never say or do in your normal frame of mind when you're under control. And since that's the reality, <clears throat> when you are angry and you realize it, don't say anything. Don't say anything. Don't do anything. Break away from the situation until you've reined it all in and are under control. <clears throat> now having said that, <clears throat> I'm going to talk to the wives for a moment. If you know your husband's upset, don't push him to communicate. Do you understand what I said? If you know your husband's upset and it's an ugly situation, and say, no, you need to come back here. We need to work this out. We need to talk about this now. Don't do that. Give him the opportunity to break away from the situation and calm down before he talks to you. Because in an inflamed emotional rage, 
the things that he says and the things that he does in his anger are going to cause more problems than the original problem. Please hear that. Sometimes it's not so much what we originally did as what we did in, re in reaction to the being angry. Okay, enough on that. James 3.13. He who is wise and understanding among you, let him show by good conduct and that his works are done, look at this, in the meekness of wisdom. Meekness, look at this, of wisdom. You have understanding. You understand how important it is to have control of your emotions and not allow your emotions to hurt others and not allow your emotions to become stumbling blocks keeping people from serving God. The last thing again that I want is for my actions to become a stumbling block to someone going to heaven. And so with that understanding and wisdom, I need to be showing it with meekness and control. Again in Proverbs 14 and 29, he who is slow to wrath has great understanding, but he who is impulsive exalts folly. So impulsive again, boom, I'm going to act. Boom, I'm going to speak. I don't have it on the sermon outline, but you know the text in Ephesians, be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. If you do lose your temper, don't say or do anything. A man who has wisdom and understanding realizes how important this is. There are people sometimes that think, well, this is just the way I am. I'm just going to keep doing this. So what? That's not Christianity. In Christianity, we recognize the flaws that are in our character. They are here, folks. I just opened up at the very beginning and told you that's one of my flaws. We need to recognize the flaws that are actually there and then deal with them, going straight into them. Proverbs 16, now 32. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. He who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. Now, someone who takes a city, you consider that person to be strong and powerful. A person who's mighty physically. What he's talking about here is emotional strength is stronger than physical strength. You hear what I just said? Emotional strength is stronger than physical strength. You may have the physical strength to be a good soldier, but do you have the emotional strength, as he says here, to rule over your spirit to where you are have self-control over your temper. That's what we're talking about here. Please realize this is part of love. And love is the greatest. And so if this is a flaw that's in our love for our family or for our fellow human beings, we need to work on the flaw and keep working on it and never stop working on it. Proverbs again in chapter 15 and verse 18. A wrathful man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger allays contention. And that is again, you're not letting the fire get started. When's the best time to put out a fire? Before it gets started. <laughs> and if it does get started, you don't put out a fire with gasoline. So if someone's raising their voice, you're really going to help them rule it in and rein it in by you raising your voice. And when they start screaming at you, well, you're just going to scream louder. All meaningful communication is over at that point. Nobody's listening anymore. And nothing said or done is going to be constructive. A person who has wisdom realizes this and they allay the contention and the fighting. They put out the fire before it even gets started. They realize that it's the fire that gets started in our anger and our temper that are spending more time trying to put out those giant fires. You see, it's how we are responding to what is going to go wrong. There are going to be things going wrong, things breaking, people behaving like they shouldn't. That's reality. How are we responding to it is the key. How are we responding to those realities? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. What credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, 
if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. Here comes somebody and they're yelling at you. They're putting you down. They're rude to you. They're sinning against you. What's the easy thing to do? I'll be honest with you. Break your leg. Yeah, that's the easiest thing to do. Is lose my temper and crush you. To where you wouldn't even think about hurting me again. I told you folks, top five. Easy laid back Wayne, I can be a bear. And so I realized it about myself. A person who loses their temper. You better watch out with that. Because you can hurt somebody physically, emotionally, and spiritually. The easy thing to do is to strike back. The easy thing to do is yell. But that's not love. Love is not easily provoked. Love is not easily angered. And when you do become angry, you do not sin at all in word or in deed. Brethren, that's what we're working toward. Proverbs 19 and verse 11. The discretion of a man makes him slow to anger, and his glory is to overlook transgression. What if they didn't apologize, Wayne? Okay. Did the people that crucified Jesus apologize? <laughs> Did the people that scourged Jesus apologize? Uh, no, they didn't. And yet he still prayed for them. His desire for them and for every one of them was and always will be that they go to heaven. If you have discretion, if you have wisdom, if you have understanding, then you're going to work diligently being slow to anger. And if you ever do get to the point to where you are angry, if you have wisdom and understanding, you're not going to allow it to cause you to sin against anybody. Colossians 3 and verse 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind. Here it is. Meekness. If we're putting on Christ, we're going to be putting on meekness. If we're putting on Christ, we're putting on trying to get control of ourselves to where what's happening around us, what's being done to us and said to us, is not going to cause us to lose it in any way. Maintain control of your emotions. Why are we doing this? 2 Timothy chapter 2, 24 through 26. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient in humility. Correcting those who are in opposition. Let's stop right there. Not quarrel. If someone loses their temper, you maintain control and with a soft answer put out the fire and help them maintain control. In the context here, we're talking about people who are lost. And what's our desire for them? Be saved. When you start quarreling with people, all meaningful communication is over. If you're yelling at someone and you're telling them the truth, are they going to hear the truth? No. Because of the way you spoke to them, even if it is the truth. I'm going to tell you why it's a great secret. If you raise your voice at your husband and you're yelling at him and you're trying to get him to change, even if what you're telling him is the truth, he will not change because of the way you spoke to him. Does there anybody here like being yelled at? No. What if the person yelling at you is telling you the truth? Doesn't matter, does it? It's because they're yelling at you. All meaningful communication is over. We need to learn this. You know, there's two things you don't talk about. Politics and religion. And it's an amazing thing. If you're around me, there's two things I want to talk about. <laughs> Politics and religion. 
<laughs> Why is it you don't want to talk about those two things? Well, because you're going to find there's going to be people that disagree with you. And when you're talking to people about religion, oh, folks, you're talking about someone's soul's eternal destiny? Are you telling me my parents are lost? Are you telling these people are going to hell? Are you telling me I'm not right with God? Oh, you see how that can really quickly turn into a quarrel. Yeah. We need to realize the reality and not get pulled into the quarrel. It is not about us proving how much we know about the Bible. It is not about us and how right we are spiritually. That's not it at all. We're trying to help the person go to heaven. And the last thing we want is our emotions and our quarreling to get in the way of the truth. The servant of the Lord must not quarrel but in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. Look at this now. If perhaps God will grant them repentance so they may come to know what? The truth. That's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to get the truth into the minds and hearts of the people. Why? And that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. There it is. We're wanting these people who are caught in the snare of the devil, who are indeed lost, because it is our great desire for them to be saved, we realize we've got to tell them the truth. And yet sometimes when we're talking about these matters, they're very sensitive and people get upset and they want to start quarreling and they're raising their voice. Okay, you don't allow that to happen. You put out the fire with self-control. You speak to them with honor. You speak to them with dignity. You speak to them with humility, with control, telling them the truth. That's all we can do is tell people the truth and encourage them to obey it. Matthew 5, 44. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That is the most difficult command in the entire new covenant right there. Your enemy, if he gets a chance, he's going to hurt you again. I need to love him? Yes. What should your desire be for your enemy? <laughs> that he be saved. Yeah, that's right. You want your enemy to be saved. And so what can you do to bring that about? You bless those who curse you. Again, you see there's meekness right there. Control. Rather than me cursing back at you because you're cursing me. Rather than me yelling at you because you're yelling at me. I bless you. And then do good to you. And then pray for you. There's two things going on here. One, you're trying to get your, your actions under self-control and meekness are going to try to help this person who is lost become saved. Two, you're not going to allow the evil that's being done against you to overcome you and ruin your life. You hear that last part? It's not on the sermon outline, but it's at the very close of the 12th chapter of Romans. Do not become overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. There's going to be times when people are going to sin against you. I'm sorry, that's just the way life is. When those moments happen, the reason you pray for them, the reason you do kindness and goodness to them, is so that you're not going to be overcome by the evil that's been done to you to where they steal your joy, steal your joy of life, and you're continually angry and upset and bitter because of what was said and done to you. That's why you learn to pass over transgressions and not allow the wickedness done against you to overcome you. Is that easy? I've already told you this is the most difficult command in the entire New Covenant. It's not easy at all. But this is what we're working toward. Romans says in chapter 12 and verse 14, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Not easily provoked. And not only that, I'm going to bless you. <laughs> I'm not going to curse you. I'm not going to do evil to you. I'm going to do good to you. Why? 
Because I want this person to wake up and realize this is the Christian right here. This is the way a Christian behaves. You realize something's different here. I'm not yelling at you. I'm not being ugly to you. To the contrary, I'm showing kindness to you. And I'm trying to get your attention to realize there's a reason I'm this way. It's because I'm a Christian and I want you to know about Christ. I want you to find your way to God through Christ. Proverbs 15 and verse 1. And we'll close with this. A soft answer turns away wrath. You see? Soft, soft answer. Someone else has lost it. Someone else is yelling at you. Someone else is sinning against you. Maintain control. A soft answer will help them put out their fire. Look at the last part of it. But a harsh word stirs up anger. So yelling back at them is going to help them rein it in, right? Yelling back at them is just going to make the fire bigger. And in that fire, you may say and do things that are going to be extremely difficult then to overcome. One last time. 2 Timothy 2, 24-26, that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil. That's where people are. What do we want for those people? To be saved. How are they going to be saved? By coming to know the truth. And the last thing I want is for me and my emotional weaknesses and my anger and wrath and the things that I say or do while I'm trying to help this person find their way to God, the last thing I want is for me to stand between them and the truth. Everybody. We want everybody to go to heaven. Even our worst enemy. To help that come to pass, we have to learn to love them regardless of what they have done and will done to us again. And then do the very best we can to get the truth to them. And help them find their way to God through Jesus. Why? Because we love them. I thank you for your kind attention. If there's anybody here this evening who is not in Christ yet, and you've come to believe that he actually is the Christ, the Son of God, Jesus is, be willing to openly confess your faith, and then driven by your faith, make the great commitment of repentance, to put off the old man, to put on the new man, and to start working at putting on Christ and growing in the Christian attributes. If you've noticed in all these sermons, when we're talking about defining love, we always go to the primary example. Who's that? God. Jesus. God is love. Our life is spent trying to put on Jesus. And when you're pretty on Jesus, you're trying to learn to put on love. Okay? Above all things, put on love, which is the bond of affection from Colossians. That's a big commitment, repentance is. But if you're willing to make that commitment, we'll be glad to baptize you into the body of Christ for the remission of your sins. You'll then be, a, then be a child of God in Christ, forgiven. You then grow as a Christian and continue to grow. I've told you where I was 40 years ago. I'll be honest with you, I'm not that guy. <laughs> Don't be afraid of me, okay? Uh, I still struggle with my temper sometimes, though. I still consider it one of my top weaknesses. But I've come a long way from where I was. But the truth of the matter is, I got a long way to go. And always will. Because who is it I'm trying to be like? Who's the example? The example is Jesus. And so I'm continually looking to the example of someone who is love. And so I'm trying to be more and more and more like him. That's what repentance is all about. That transformation of trying to be more like Jesus every day. If you're already in Christ and you realize there's sin between you and your God that you haven't dealt with, you need to deal with it. Our God is gracious. He is merciful. He's willing to forgive. Take the sin to your God. Confess it to him and turn from it. We will pray for you. We will pray with you. And we'll do the very best we can to encourage you. If you are subject to the gospel call in any way, let us know while we stand and sing the song that we've been selected.